Ladies and gentlemen, if I can just have your attention for the uh, wonderful speakers we have this afternoon. And I'll introduce Dr. Peter Holgram from C4. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so welcome back, everyone. We have one uh, last session today, which is a keynote session. The keynotes will be very short, very to the point. And as we always say, repetition is the mother of knowledge and confusion is the beginning of learning. But we have no time for repetition and we have no time for confusion. Now, now it's a keynote and we really want to know the key points. So we have four speakers. I'll introduce them as they take the stage. And, and uh, I really look forward to this session. This is really a nice ending of, of a very, very in, instructive day. We talked about prosperity. We talked about in integrated solutions. We talked about partnerships. We talked about climate change and resilience. We talked about many things. Now we will hear the key points. The first speaker uh, is Johan Rockström, Professor of Environmental Science, Director of the Stockholm Resilience Center, and also a fellow alumni from the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. Johan, you are well known in these circles. Most welcome to take the stage. I think you have a PowerPoint as well, so please go ahead. Thank you, Peter. And um, to be dashing right on it, I think we all recognize that uh, 310,000 people on the streets of New York is a manifestation that the world is starting to recognize that we are in an urgent planetary crisis in terms of the need for a transformation into a safe operating space within a stable and resilient planet. And we all know in this room that that will not occur if we don't get it right on agriculture. It will not occur. We talk only on emissions reductions in industry and transport sectors in the whole fossil energy sector, but agriculture is the decisive challenge. And this seven minutes will take us through, I hope, some of those opportunities and challenges we're facing. Business is recognizing this, as we also know. Let's see if this works. Should I do something? It is this one? No. Sorry about that. Business is recognizing this, as you've seen from the Global Risk Report, which I find fascinating where 2,000 CEOs are interviewed about their priorities in terms of what is the challenge in an interdependent, inter, in a totally interconnected world. And what we find is that issues related to water security, climate change, biodiversity, nutrients, agriculture are center stage to the worries among business leaders. In fact, there is a recognition, I would argue, that we've reached a new juncture. Up until recently, we could argue that our conventional economic model, our conventional way of building our cultural development worked quite fine as long as we lived on a relatively small world residing on a relatively large planet. We could dump large parts of our, of our environmental impacts on a very forgiving, resilient and planetary system with a high buffering capacity. Since 1989, roughly, we have the empirical evidence that that has changed. We're now hitting the ceiling of the ecological capacity of planet Earth to support humanity. We are a relatively large world on a small planet. We've saturated the atmospheric space. We've saturated the nitrogen phosphorus budgets. We're recognizing that we can no longer exclude tipping points in the large-scale systems. This is based on empirical evidence of the great acceleration, which you've all seen, which is just a reminder that this is not only carbon dioxide, which has exponentially increased since the 1950s. It's basically any parameter that matters for human well-being, from biodiversity loss to ocean acidification. These curves synchronize in the following way. Ten years after the Second World War, that's when we expand into the Great Acceleration, and we're now at the top of these empirical curves. We're truly in a new state in terms of transformative change. This applies for the same way with regards to food-related unhealth issues from obesity, stuntness, non-communicable diseases, diabetes, looking the same way. So we have really an enormous complex related to food. And why can we accuse the agricultural system to be the culprit number one? Well, it is because of the facts behind these exponential curves that we all know in terms of number one cause for loss of biodiversity, number one consumer of fresh water, single largest emitter of greenhouse gases. These are the facts that make agriculture so decisive. The interesting thing is that there's nothing in terms of evidence suggesting that agriculture could not transform from being the big challenge to being the large solution. 
but we have to load the dice with the empirical and increasing evidence that climate change is changing the picture very quickly. This is just the AR5 map showing in red the regions that will face, on average, 25% or more loss of precipitation under a two-degree future. So we need suddenly also to build in very, very deep elements of resilience in the systems to cope with an increasingly turbulent future. So this means that any farming system in the world must now connect to the global scale. When Ban Ki-moon pointed out at Rio Plus 20 that global sustainability has now become a prerequisite for poverty alleviation at the local scale, this is a new definition of sustainable development. It's also the recognition that sustainability must therefore be the very entry point for agricultural development. It can no longer be agricultural productivity, efficiency, optimization, and reduce impacts at the end of the pipeline. It must be using sustainability and ecosystem services as the very vehicle for successful building of resilient farming systems. And a lot of empirical research shows that this actually can be done and the evidence behind its value. And that, in fact, resilient and ecosystem services forming the basis for cultural development and ecosystem services is increasingly understood also as being key to achieve many of the sustainable development goals. Now, one reason why this is so decisive for our long-term future is that planetary stability depends to a large extent on the regulatory functions in the Earth system. This is, in my mind, the most dramatic evidence of that, that 55% of our emissions of carbon dioxide are taken up by the biosphere. And you know this story with 25% in terrestrial ecosystems, 25% in oceans, the world's largest subsidy to the world economy, all categories, all climate models, which, remember, on average is predicting that we will be hitting four degrees warming by the end of the century, assume that this service will continue with no assumptions on any reduction. There's no other way of securing the biosphere sink of carbon, the four and a half gigatons per year, without sustainable agricultural systems in the world, without avoiding expansion into natural ecosystems. We increasingly learn, moreover, that critical biomes are part of regulating the stability, that the Southeast Asian monsoon and the West African monsoon depends on a stable rainforest systems in the Amazonas, that the Arctic is a stabilizer of even weather systems hitting in on the east coast of the US, as shown by Superstorm Sandy that in fact savannas, boreal forests, terrestrial forests are all part of regulating the stability of rainfall and therefore agricultural systems across the world. So it means that we now need to transition the world food production system into a safe operating space of a stable planet. And science, I would argue, is now increasingly able to define that safe operating space based on advancements in earth system science, and, and many of you are represented in this room, defining quantitatively the budget within which we can stay safe. And this actually puts on the table a finite carbon budget, a finite nitrogen budget, a finite phosphorus budget, a recognition that we now need to maintain the remaining forests on Earth, and quantifying these, which gives a completely new definition of sustainable agriculture. So we can, I would argue, quantify a new criteria for what it means to sustainably intensify agriculture, a system that meets a two-degree limit, which translates to 1,000 gigatons of carbon dioxide emitted so in, in the future. In terms of land use change, fresh water use, in terms of the 44 or so million tons of nitrogen that we can maximum release from the atmosphere to avoid tipping points through eutrophication in freshwater systems, and so on. And that's very interesting because, for one, we've never done it before. And secondly, I would challenge ourselves to say, I don't think there's any farming system in the world that fulfills this list. Not even the organic agricultural systems in the world do it because they depend on fossil energy sources. So this is an enormous challenge for us as, as the agricultural community to uh, not only deliver resilient food systems for a world population of 9, 10, 11 billion, but also do it in a way that maintains the stability of the Earth system. Now, as been discussed today, a lot of science shows that this can be done. There is actually evidence to suggest we can feed 9 billion people. This paper that John Foley led from um, Minnesota showed that this is possible, but didn't address the sustainability dimensions in full. 
This room is filled with expertise on the innovations that show that we can actually double, triple, quadruple yield levels, many times even through sustainable, resilient practices from water harvesting, conservation tillage, recycling nutrients in productive sanitation systems, watershed management initiatives that are extremely well prepared for navigating the Anthropocene. Now is the time to go to scale, and how can we induce partnerships to do that? And finally, I would argue that the policy domain, believe it or not, despite the inability in the political system to take global leadership, is starting to understand this new predicament. When the Sustainable Development Goals framework document from the Open Working Group is put on the table, it does in fact stipulate through its 17 goals that eradicating hunger and poverty is possible, but it needs to be done within a safe climate system, a safe biodiversity system, a safe water system, and a safe marine and ocean system. So we're starting to see the contours of a development paradigm of an economy that operates to serve society, which in turn operates within a stable and resilient earth system. And right at the center of this is agriculture. And agriculture therefore plays this decisive pivotal role over the next decade. And I can see no better community than this one to kind of take on that charge. Thank you. Uh, certainly no confusion there. <laughs> agriculture is taking center stage in sustainable development, and uh, agriculture science and environmental science are coming together. These are, these are important steps in, in hopefully the right direction. So thanks again for your leadership in this, Johan, and, and we look forward to the next scientific findings from, from your end. Um, our next speaker, uh, Her Excellency Krajda Verburg, is the chair of the World Food Security Committee, which is uh, based in Rome, meeting in Rome normally, uh, and um, has been a, a leading uh, person in, in our agriculture and food security world for a very long time. Sometimes we discuss where and when the climate smart agriculture concept actually began. Uh, but we, I'm sure we all appreciate the leadership that uh, the Netherlands has shown in this, particularly when uh, Gerda was the Minister of Agriculture some time ago in the Netherlands. So, Gerda, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Peter. Yes, it's important to have the Climate Smart uh, Agriculture Alliance, and it doesn't matter anymore who uh, was exactly the founding uh, father, but I think in our disputes we have, uh, we have done a lot uh, to make it uh, move into the right direction. Ladies and gentlemen, let me first introduce myself a little bit more, because I'm uh, introduced as the chair of the Committee on World Food Secure, Security, which is true, um, but the committee is not a committee with only representatives of governments. It is the committee where all the stakeholders that are connected to uh, agriculture, food security, nutrition, and all related topics are gathered around the table. Now, let me tell you, this is challenging because we have representatives of governments, my colleagues, the uh, ambassadors and perm reps. We have uh, people from your society. CGR is representing uh, the research, you know, how institutions on uh, agriculture and, uh, and food uh, topics. Um, we have uh, people from civil society, from grassroots organizations, social movements, to the uh, big international NGOs like Oxfam, and we have private sector on board, and beside this also uh, foundations and financial institutions. To agree upon um, um, uh, important topics takes time. It's very time-consuming because you have to, um, to uh, discuss, but it, it, already, it, it is very fast that you start to negotiate, and it's, so it's possible to negotiate on one topic uh, for two years, for instance, principles on responsible investments in agriculture, sustainable agriculture, and food systems. But it's worthwhile, worthwhile because once you agree at a global level, um, it is already communicated to grassroots uh, uh, level so that at grassroots level you can really make it happen. And that's where it's all about. Thank you very much, Frank Reiberman, and your uh, team for organizing this important day, for this opportunity to discuss the role of research to achieve the goals of food security and sustainable development. 
As chair of CFS, I like, like I would first like to emphasize how food security is profoundly linked, and I would say embedded in sustainable development. And as you know, CFS has geared towards action, and research is key to it. In CFS, we work on a lot of topics which have an, um, an, an uh, incidence on food security and nutrition, price volatility, land tenure, climate change, social protection, biofuels, food losses and food waste, innovation and investments, etc. And these are the same issues that will shape sustainable development. Our high-level panel of experts on food security and nutrition has acknowledged the very concrete link between food security and nutrition and sustainable food systems. There can be no food and nutrition security short and long term um, without um, sustainable food systems. Ensuring food security and nutrition for all worldwide of present and, and future generation characterizes sustainable food systems. This is why food security and, su and sustainable agriculture is so important in the post-2015 agenda. Considering taking the entry point of food security and nutrition enables to have a people-centered approach to the sustainability of food systems. It enables to better integrate the social dimension, often left behind the traditional economic and environment debate. The social dimension brings the farmer at the center of the picture with jobs and employment. For instance, as we have, have recommended last year in our discussion on smallholder investments. How can research and innovation reduce the drudgery of agricultural labor, particularly for women, is an issue that is too often overlook, overlooked. And please put gender in the very heart of all your research and advisory work, because it's necessary. Consequences of adopting a food security and approach to agricultural research is the next topic I'd like to say something about. Having this entry point of food security, the key question for the development of agriculture is how it can contribute to ensure food and nutrition security. Of course, one key dimension of it will be ensuring the long-term productivity of agriculture, which is one core mission of the CGR. But as shown by the discussions today, there are also other dimensions. We think in CFS that research is part of action for food security and nutrition, and we often address it in our recommendations. And here are the main messages. Research has to address a more complex set of objectives, increase yields, but also stabilize them, center the farmer and the farm, and also go beyond towards value chains and the food systems, rural transformations, how to feed the cities, and market development. Let me give you two examples. Innovation in the field often means changes in the value chains from inputs to outputs, etc. On the other hand, our work on social protection shows that it can play a key role to enable invest investment by smallholders. There is a need to adopt the same time, at the same time a farmer focus and wide-angle lens to agricultural research, research because it is at the level of the farm that all dimensions interact where problems and issues converge and need to be treated in coherence, natural, natural resources, investments, nutrition, climate, and you can mention, we can mention also other topics. It means new approaches on how to do research. It means also new institutional approaches. Three things. A, 
It requires a genuine dialogue with farmers and users to understand their needs, taking into account the difficulties that can exist in obtaining the views of women and disadvantaged groups. Because farmers are able to, uh, to express the specific specificity of their situation and needs. And it is at farm level that everything reconnects. And the second reason is farmers are the ones finally deciding what they do on the farm. These are conditions to make research translate into real systematic, uh, systemic, systemic, systemic uh, changes on the ground. It requires a good two-way inter, two interface between researchers and farmers extension services, and the use of modern technologies. B, it requires also mechanisms at national level to agree inclusively on priorities for research, given the various contexts. The CGR has an important role here with national research institutions. C, at international level, research and research institutions have an important role to play as doers for food security and nutrition. The CGR is a key stakeholder of the CFS. It is also as member, it is also as member of the advisory group of CFS, representing all research beyond CGR. And I expect that the CGR will bring the results of this day to the attention of the Committee on World Food Security. Ladies and gentlemen, farming is knowledge intensive. More than ever, we need research to achieve the goals of food security and sustainable development. We need policies and institutions for it. We need more investments in research, more public-private partnerships, more synergies between national and international research. And to do this, we need a joint vision and we need to invest in trust into what we will do together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gerda, and also thank you particularly for reminding us that the real-world decisions are made by the farmers and not in the General Assembly. Um, and also that perhaps this is a challenge for us in CDIR. That we really need to have this reach from the political level all the way down to the ground, and this is something we need to bear in mind constantly. Um, so, ne our next speaker, um, I would say, barely needs an introduction, but I'll do it anyway. Dr. Rajanda Pachauri, most welcome to this closing, uh, closing keynote session of, of our de development dialogue today. Uh, we all know you as the head of the Energy and Resources Institute, Terry, but we of course know you as the chair of the Intergovernmental Panel of Cl Climate Change since 2002. And in particular, I would like to point out that the, the latest assessment report, number five, I found really, really emphasizing the agriculture issues, the agricultural role in, in the challenges we are facing in climate change, both in terms of adaptation and in, in mitigation. So please, Dr. Pachauri, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. When I asked Peter how long I'm permitted to speak, he gave me around five minutes. I may spill over by a minute or two, but this week I've acquired a new skill. I had to speak in the opening session of the UN Secretary General's Summit, and we started with uh, a target of six minutes, and then it was negotiated down to three minutes. So I had to tell them, I had to tell this very important audience, all that has been found in the three working group reports of the IPCC in the grand space of three minutes. So um, I'll try to do somewhat similar justice over here. Uh, but let me say that I'm very happy that we are focusing on this sector. And I think Peter's absolutely right in the fifth assessment report. We have highlighted the importance of what we refer to as the AFOLU sector. That's agriculture, forestry, and land use. And clearly, 
If you look at the contribution of greenhouse gas emissions from this sector, it amounts to 24 percent. So obviously we have to pay attention on this sector. The other point I'd like to make is essentially in the form of a plea to the CGIAR system to perhaps focus on research that might help us come up with solutions which would deal essentially with the problems of the small farmer in the future. Because small farmers are going to be extremely vulnerable to the impacts of climate change and that's going to take away their livelihoods, their ability to get adequate nutrition which is already at very low levels and I think it would lead to an enormous loss of welfare for human society at large if we did not address this problem and I can't think of an organization better than the CGIAR system to focus on this as an immediate as well as a long-term goal because the impacts of climate change are going to become progressively more serious. Let me just give you a few quick facts from the uh, AR5, the fifth assessment report. We now have 95 percent certainty that most of the changes that have taken place since the beginning of the last century are the result of human actions essentially uh, the result of an increase in the concentration of greenhouse gases. And the manifest in manifestation of these is, of course, in the form of temperature increase, which has been 0 0.85 degrees Celsius since the beginning of the last century up to 2010. But the atmosphere has warmed, so have the oceans. The oceans have warmed by <coughs> taking approximately 90% of the heat that's been generated by climate change since 1970 onwards. So that has very serious implications for marine life. Of course, when we talk about agriculture, we are talking essentially about what happens on the land, but I think there is a very clear case for looking at uh, what we get by way of nutrition from the sea as well. Uh, and uh, ocean acidification, which is resulting from a total of 30 percent of all the carbon dioxide emissions that have gone into the atmosphere since the beginning of industrialization is another issue that's going to affect marine life and marine ecosystems. The other thing that we need to worry about as far as the oceans are concerned is the problem of sea level rise. In a large part of coastal areas in the world, you would find uh, intrusion of salinity as a result of which agriculture obviously will suffer and we therefore have to come up with response strategies by which we can deal with this reality. Uh, I also want to mention that there are direct impacts of climate change on agriculture and now there's growing evidence that certainly well above two degrees Celsius if there is an increase in temperature at that level or beyond, there would be very serious impacts on agricultural yields. But those impacts are already taking place, particularly for wheat, maize and rice. And these, as you know, are the staple, uh, the, the source of, uh, of food for a large part of the population. And we would also see a slowing down of economic growth as a result of climate change. And it would prolong and create new poverty traps. And these will be confined not only to the developing world, but even in the developed world. So these poverty traps are going to grow, and that obviously has major implications on the whole challenge of distribution of, uh, of food and proper nutrition. Now, let me say something on the uh, direct link between climate change and, uh, and agriculture. Rural areas will be affected because both in the near term and beyond, we would find that water availability and supply will be affected as a result of climate change. And that has direct implications for agricultural activity. And naturally, that's going to affect food security. And with these changes in agricultural incomes, in the downward direction, you would find that uh, farmers will find it very difficult to bring about any kind of progressive changes in their agricultural practices 
because that clearly requires uh, resources that have to go into bringing about a transformation or transition of agriculture. And if their incomes are affected, obviously they will be constrained in their ability to bring that about. I also want to mention the fact that there are going to be shifts between food and non-food crops. And this is something that I believe requires a substantial amount of study and modeling. With the impacts of climate change, what's going to happen to the mix that we will, we will see in the future. And as was said earlier, decisions are not taken by the Security Council or the UN General Assembly. Decisions are taken by farmers. And we need to see what kind of situation they would be confronted with uh, as a result of which they will have to bring about these shifts. And I think that has <clears throat> major implications, not only for the welfare of the farming community, but also for food security. I um, want to mention another impact of climate change, and that's in the nature of extreme events. In 2011, we had brought out a special report on extreme events and disasters as a result of climate change. And um, we found that clearly the greater impacts would take place on sectors with closer links to climate. And that includes water, it includes water, agriculture, forestry, and tourism. I remember having a conversation with the director of um, um, one of the large food companies, uh, I don't mind mentioning, Nestle, and he said that we are very worried about the impacts of climate change because that really hits their bottom line. They are in a business where agriculture, uh, livestock products, uh, milk, are obviously going to be their bread and butter, no pun intended. And therefore, uh, they are concerned about the impacts of climate change. Now, if a company like that is interested and concerned about this phenomenon, clearly those of us who represent, um, you know, the research and academic community must focus on this with a much greater uh, uh, level of attention. I, I must say a few things about changes on the demand side. On the supply side, the evidence is overwhelming that yes, there will be some parts of the world that may actually benefit from increases, uh, increases in yields as a result of climate change. But the net effect is overwhelmingly towards the direction of decline in agricultural yields. I want to mention quickly a small anecdote uh, way back in 2004. Uh, Russia had organized a major conference on climate change and President Putin spoke over there, and this is before the Kyoto Protocol had been ratified. And he read out his speech, which was totally uninspiring, didn't leave you with any answers on whether Russia would ratify the Kyoto Protocol or not. And then, you know, uh, Klaus Topfer spoke, uh, Yoko Walla Hunter spoke, and I spoke, and I focused on the problems of the developing world. And President Putin does this. So he wants to speak again. This time he doesn't speak with any notes. So he says, everybody tells me climate change is good for Russia because we won't spend so much on fur coats and that large parts of our land will become suitable for agriculture. And I said, my God, what's he going to say? He says, but I have to worry about floods. I have to worry about droughts. I also have to worry about impacts on other parts of the world. And I found that very encouraging. So the point I'd like to make is that even though you may feel that Russia is going to benefit from climate change, obviously the net effect of that may be negative even to Russian society. Now, let me just say a word about what we should do on the demand side for food. And here I want to highlight the fact that in mitigation options, in the fifth assessment report, we have talked specifically about, of course, movement towards renewable sources of energy on a large scale, possibly. Um, we haven't in any way prescribed anything. We're not supposed to. The IPCC doesn't do any policy prescriptive work. We are only doing policy relevant assessment. So the options that we've talked about are nuclear, renewables, 
carbon capture and storage, bioenergy on a large scale, and bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, and of course, uh, changes on the demand side, whether you look at the transport sector or the energy that's consumed in buildings, all of this would require major transformation so that the demand for energy itself can be moderated in a way that we're able to meet with this demand. And last evening at another event, Johann Rockstrom said something very important, and he, of course, he used the analogy of spaceship Earth, something that I talk about as well. And he said that, you know, there's only so much you can hold on this spaceship Earth. And if we want the certain parts of the world to develop and grow and move out of poverty, then those in the developed world will probably have to consume less. And of course, lower consumption is certainly something that we have talked about as a mitigation option. Now, what I want to say is that if I was to translate what Johann Rockstrom said last evening, it reminds me of what Gandhi mentioned. He said, we must live simply so that others can simply live. And I think this is entirely true. Uh, we have an enormous amount of waste in the food cycle, and waste not only in terms of the physical quantity of what is wasted, I would say waste even in the manner in which we produce protein for our intake. And here I'm not advocating anything because, as I've said on earlier occasions, I, some years ago I used to talk about uh, an option of eating less meat. The result was that those who didn't like it made mincemeat of me. So I don't want to repeat that experience. It wasn't a pleasant experience. However, let me say that dietary choices do have a major impact on how agriculture should shape up in the future. And therefore, I'm particularly happy that we are focusing on this entire sector. And there is an enormous amount of work to be done. And I would submit that there's a need for climate scientists and agricultural specialists to work together so that we can look at a whole range of choices in the future and outcomes that we would like and also have a system like the CGIR system mount a major coordinated program of research and development by which some of the, the uh, negative impacts of climate change can be countered by bringing about changes in the types of crops we grow, uh, agricultural practices that we institute, and of course, on the demand side, we certainly need to bring about some reappraisal of what would be best in the interests of global society and different parts of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pachauri, for bringing us to a uh, bigger picture once again. Um, bringing up the demand side of the equation is certainly not easy, uh, even whether we get minced or not. Um, but uh, it is clearly a big part of, of the equation. And we might even continue on the big picture and bring in the health aspects as well in this. And then we are covering several of the sustainable development goals in, in, our, in our discourse. So thank you again. Thank you for your leadership. Then our final and uh, final speaker in this session is a CDIR colleague. Jonathan Wadsworth is the head of the uh, fund office and also the, uh, uh, has the interesting role of, of herding our members of the fund council as the secretary of, of the fund council. So Jonathan, tell us what you make of all this. Thank you, Peter. Well, this is a really unique experience for me. Uh, let me disclose that to start with. I've never had the privilege of following three speakers of such high quality and eminence and absolute, in my view, my humble opinion, utter sensible words that all three have contributed to this conversation. I'm really thankful, but I'm in somewhat of a trepidation in that I'll be compared, my feeble words will be compared with what's gone before. But I'm really grateful for what, what's been said by the previous speakers, because I think it fits in quite closely to what I would like to say. This week, or today rather, 
has been the culmination of quite an interesting week for many of us here in the room, and I would hope for all of us in the room. It's been a week that has brought many different communities together, many different expertises, many different walks of life. One moment I was speaking to people from the insurance industry, the next moment I was speaking to people from NGO groups, and then again I was speaking to people from big agribusiness companies in different events around this city. And bringing all that together and thinking through the various discussions that I've witnessed today has been a salutary experience for me. Unfortunately, I can't go into that because otherwise I would need to speak for a very long time. So I'll try and stick to what I wanted to say. But there's a, we've got a lot of food for thought, or certainly I have, from what's happened this week. The CGIR, having played a role in the Alliance for Climate Smart Agriculture, made a very important commitment to support that alliance and to support that work and to reach 500 million farmers, small farmers, with climate smart agriculture solutions over the coming years. The CGIR fund, uh, which I represent, made a commitment to continue on our fundraising work with the, the CGIR community and the donor community and other partners in future to try and redouble and work tirelessly to redouble our funding of the CGIR. We've had tremendous growth over the last five years, doubling to a billion dollars a year in total, and we set the target to double again to 2020 to two billion dollars. Why, why do I say that? Because it's been brought up, I think, in all the people who have spoken previously in these three sections, in these three expositions, there were things which were, I couldn't agree more with. Research is key. Research is fundamental. Research and innovation and science are absolutely a cornerstone of where we need to take things. We need to do more. Research is more complex. There are more strands coming together in the research panorama. And what I would like to say is research costs money. The CGIR is poised, having gone through a, a process of change and continuing along that change route to actually do more, do better, do more profound research. But research needs resources. So we'll be working hard and we'll be working with others in the community and with the CGIR to try and get those resources for the research which so urgently needs to be done. In the morning, to set off the morning, we had a very interesting session called investing for impact. The idea was to bring together some donors, some funders, some prospective, prospective funders, and some of the community from the science across the CGIR and civil society to talk about what does that mean. We invest in research and what does it produce? And from listening to all those people that spoke this morning on panels, the expectation, of course, is that research, science, and technology actually changes people's lives. Not now only, but it changes people's lives for the future. And talking about the climate, what more could we say? We're thinking 20, 50, and we're thinking up to the end of the century. The evidence is absolutely clear. What more evidence do we, do we need than cases of, of the world that have invested heavily in agricultural research and innovation over the last three or four decades that are now accelerating ahead in productivity gains in their agricultural systems without endangering the planet. The case of Brazil, which, whose agricultural productivity is growing at a phenomenal rate year on year on year. By 2030, Brazil will be producing more than double the food that it needs for its domestic population and will be exporting half of what it produces. Whereas in other parts of the world, Africa, if the African agricultural productivity increase continues at its present rate, in 2030, Africa will either have expanded into agricultural areas which aren't suitable for agriculture, or will be importing food for 75% of its population if it's unable to increase the productivity. Science and technology and innovation is the engine for increasing productivity without damaging the environment. And we heard many people this morning talk about that. We talked about the need to unleash 
the capability and the accessibility of small farmers, especially women small farmers, to a, a level playing field of access to resources. Because we know from the scientific literature, from the work that's been done, that if women had an equal access to the means of production, they would be, we, would produce, we could produce something like 20 or 30% more. Simple fact, which has been shown very clearly. Um, I'm going to rush through some of these things, Peter, because I know you want to get to the end. But some of our panelists this morning talked about the tension between public goods. In other words, the CGIR works on international public goods, non-rival, non-excludable research for everybody, and a tension somewhat with the private nature of agriculture. Agriculture is a private sector uh, activity. Each individual farmer, small or big, is a private entrepreneur, and that's a business. And so, where do we stand on this? this these are, there are boundaries and there are definitions which we need to work with and understand, and one of our panelists said, let's blur those definitions. Why stick to precise definitions? Let's make things work more easily. There's a there's a growing recognition, certainly from the private sector side, that they need to get engaged and they need to help support the, the, the CGIR research, and they would like to. And we need to work with them and find new ways of working with the private sector as we move forward. There are, there are new sources of partnership and new sources of uh, resources for research out there. We had the opportunity to have a discussion with... Uh, with Jada McKenna, uh, USAID Assistant uh, Administrator, who again put research and evidence at the centre of their programme in developing countries in agriculture and food security. That was a very strong message to us, uh, to work with, with that, that partner. But also making the point that a strong enabling and regulatory environment is essential for that science and the evidence base to really be used for the best interests of the whole community, not only poor farmers, small farmers, not only for the environment, but also for the poor consumers. And the importance of multi-sectoral partnerships were again emphasized. Final point, we had the pleasure and the honor to be with the Ambassador Oiki, Director General for Global Issues of the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He talked about TCAD. Uh, an annual, no, a, a every five-year event that the Japanese government stimulates for its development work, work with Africa. And he said something really interesting, which I think gives us pause for thought and gives us encouragement for the future. He said, when these TICAD conferences were started 20 years ago, he mentioned that solutions tended to focus around technical assistance. What can Japan provide for the poor farmers, the poor rural dwellers, the people that need help in Africa. Recently, in the, in the most recent conference, he said things had turned on their head and African people were coming to that conference looking for investment opportunities for their own countries. Quite different from technical assistance to, in a sense, empowerment of we, with your help, can invest in the right things to do. Things are very, very complex. Listening to the previous three expositions makes me think that our definition of agricultural efficiency and productivity can be taken as very narrow. It's not only about thinking of outputs in terms of food, kilos of food, that's important, but it's also outputs in terms of, to use a very general term, term environmental services of agriculture. And this is what I heard a few times this, in the previous session downstairs. There are many environmental services that agriculture provides at the same time as providing food. I'll leave that there, people want to finish. But I was, those who heard me speak this morning may have thought I had a very narrow vision on what productivity is. I'm quite prepared to amplify that vision now and say there's more to what agriculture gives than simply food. And I think this conference has really brought that out. And to me, at least, uh, it's been very illuminating. So 
everything that's happened today fits into CGIR's ongoing efforts to recreate its, uh, and refresh and re-energize its strategy and results framework moving forward for ever more ambitious, exciting, and meaningful programs of research with suggestions coming from the floor which have been very valuable. So I would thank you for your time and energy. Thank you for listening to me at the end of a, such a packed day and after having such eminent speakers. But thank you, I hope you share my passion to improve the lives of other people and that the, the CGIR is always endeavouring to achieve. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Jonathan, for reminding us about the complex nature of uh, the organization that we're working with uh, and, and also that we are in a change process. So thank you so much for that. But it's not quite the end because I have my, this will be the end for me, but uh, my, my last task today is to introduce uh, the two speakers that will help us close today's session. And they now stand behind between us and the networking cocktail. So this is quite a challenge. So I would like to introduce uh, Stephanie Strom, who is a journalist with the uh, uh, New York Times. And I'm told that her topic as a journalist is food, anything related to food. <laughs> so I'm very curious to learn more about what that might mean. And of course, Frank, Frank Riesbermann, our CEO of the CDR Consortium. We know you. And uh, we would very much like to hear what you have made of this day and how you have planned to make a dynamic ending to, to the conversation. Thank you very much. Well, I've moderated two panels, and so I told Frank that he's responsible for dynamism, okay? So if, if it's not dynamic, blame him, right? <laughs> so why don't you tell us a little bit about what you've been hearing uh, today? What are, what are some of the things you've heard that have been interesting and unexpected? Well, we came here to New York to listen, right, from, to hear what the policymakers who are deeply involved in the SDGs and in the Climate Summit have to tell us. And I think they certainly delivered. We had many more messages than I can summarize this quickly. But, you know, even though I've heard John Rockstrom a number of times, I can't help but be impressed when he gave his speech here on planetary boundaries and, you know, said, hey, agriculture is the number one culprit that pushed us to the edge of these planetary boundaries. And we really have to find a way to stabilize the planet, to deliver sustainable agricultural intensification. That might mean a little bit more than what we sort of casually refer to uh, in our day-to-day -day work. So I think that is, that you can't help but be impressed and say, are we really ready to live up to that challenge? Are we really ready to deliver what it will take? And of course this morning, you know, it started right off with Minister Adesina and uh, the Commissioner, Roda P, saying you have to take it to the farmer. You know, that cuts right through our normal jargon where we mean the same thing. Yes, we have to take it to the farmer and we have to think through what that means and what that means for partnership because we will not take it to the farmer personally, but we will have to make sure that the innovations we come up with will go to the farmer. And yes, I think uh, probably many of us here were impressed by our own former colleague, Kanayo Nwanza, now president of IFAD, where he almost recounted his own personal story from, you know, working for rice and the new rices for Africa and now telling us about the importance of social science and indeed uh, speaking passionately about the wisdom that he wanted to pass on to us, uh, including the science of policies, uh, Schengen. I mean, we were all, I think, impressed to hear that and found that inspiring. So I think we heard a lot today that inspired us. So how is CGIAR going to take everything you've heard and move forward with it? We will, really. I mean, I, I know that I've gone to many of these meetings and people say, we will take this forward. And you're like, <laughs> boring, big black hole, you know, <laughs> we will take it. No, we actually, we are in the middle of a very exciting time in the CGIR. We are arguing, we are struggling, we are fighting over our next strategy. I mean, fighting the good fight. What is it really that should be the results that we will be held accountable for? 
And you know, this is not a few consultants in the back room. This is our donors getting in there and saying, this is what we think the results are that are important to us. It's our scientists getting in there and saying, can we really deliver that? It's messy, it's exciting, and it's exactly what should happen. So we are right in the middle of trying to come up with our new strategy and results framework, which people have described as the most critical document for the CGIR for the next five or 10 years. And then over the next year or two, we will be developing the next generation of CGIR research programs. Okay. And we will do that in very close consultation with our partners in the field. I'm imagining that you know our 10 programs working in Bangladesh will come together and have consultations in Bangladesh that says, so what will we deliver against those results and how can we align that with the vision of the Bangladesh government, of the Bangladesh NGOs representing farmers, so that we can really come up with a program that we can bring back to our donors and say this is good outcomes, we will come up with verifiable results, we will be value for money, but we also know that we will deliver stuff that farmers want and that governance prioritize. So that is where all this goes. <laughs> okay. And so what then is the purpose of research in agricultural development today? And how is it different from what it might have been in the past? I was really gratified to hear so many people say today and yesterday that agriculture, agro-food systems, and then for us, innovation in agro-food systems, and therefore research as the engine that drives innovation is the backbone of sustainable development. Or as Mark Kackler said it, Agriculture is indispensable if we want to make development sustainable. So there's many forms of saying that, but I think okay. that's it. Okay. So in, I, in the two sessions I was in, one of the critiques that I heard was that, well, CGI, IAR, I told you I was going to stumble over that. Um, the they, they, <laughs> they come in and they treat the farmers or the people they're working with like they're subcontractors and they expect them to go out and get a bunch of data and deliver it back and then create research out of it themselves. Yep. Does that happen? That's fair. <laughs> you know. And so what, how are you, what are you going to do about it? This is probably one of the most interesting sort of conundrums or contradictions I know because I go around to CG centers and people honestly pride themselves on the strength of their partnerships. <laughs> and then, you know, with Juan Carlos Restrepo, we go to GFAR and we speak to the NGOs, and they criticize us <laughs> for not being open enough. And those two realities are both true. And I would say, I've gone to my colleagues and I've sometimes said, so how many partners do you have? Oh, we have 244 partnerships. I say, how many what percentage of the budgets do those partners share? 10%? <laughs> and then in some ways, then, that, you know, then we've heard enough. We, we have to find a way where it's not the 244 partners that matter, it's a few key partners that matter that play with us on a level playing field, that have a fair share of the budget, that are part of our governance structure, that lead our work packages. And some of our centers, some of our programs have that exactly right. And in other areas, we have to still live up to that promise to really open up the CGIR. So I, I think we can do that. We are aware of this critique, and I think it is Well, you were telling fair. me about one where the money got... How, explain that a little bit to the audience. Well, we, ha we ha you know, I'm Dutch. We worked in the European Union with these silly rules that the bureaucrats said, you know, every program has to have at least two partners from another part of the world and you know all these little rules that as a researcher I always experienced as a pain in the neck <laughs> you know everybody was struggling at the last moment before they submitted a proposal to find a partner but over time those simple rules actually changed the name of the game we have real partnership emerge from that and we've been playing with similar rules and in the challenge program of water and food we said a handful of years ago every program that gets approved, has to have at least a third of the budget go to national partners, and at least one of the work packages has to be led by a national partner. Mm -hmm. Now that certainly pushed through change very quickly. 
we haven't come to agreement that we should do that you know, system-wide, and then my colleagues argue that not all, you know, one size doesn't fit all and so on. But even, even if we don't introduce those rules, we have to get to the spirit of, of just that, I think, to get over that hump. And, you know, I think we are changing. There's, there is something to it that the CGIR isn't really, you know, your grandfather CGIR. <laughs> if you go out there now, a lot of centers have the last five years hired a lot of young people, hired are doing different things. So when I visit the CG centers, they're really not always the centers that people remember or imagine. But I also think it's fair that the proof of the pudding is in the eating and we have to deliver and we have to show to our partners that we are different. So if you if, give us one example of, of what you think demonstrates change in the system, in CGI. It's not fake, there's a long list, where do I start? <laughs> Let's, our program, CCAFs, our climate change program that was kind of central on the stage here uh, in the last mm -hmm. few days, mm -hmm. I think you go out and you talk to the partners of CCAFs and they experience this new model of partnership. We're working with people outside the CGIR. I don't think we're too possessive. I think we listen, we communicate, we reach out, and we get the the kudos back. Mm -hmm. People appreciate that. And I don't hear anybody complain about, well, I hear people that we can still do better. Mm -hmm. But there is, I think, recognition that that's a very different partnership. Okay. So we, we, we will, I think, model some of our other partnerships more along those lines. Okay. So maybe finally talk a little bit about how everyone out here can hold CGIAR accountable for making the changes that it's making. It's not that long ago, I was a director of one of the CG centers and we were evaluated and that bunch of very learned academics said, so how many publications did you produce? <laughs> and we said, okay, well, this many. And were they in high impact journals? <laughs> it, yes, well, not always, but you know, we also have these development outcomes. So how many publications did you produce? <laughs> Per scientist. So we have really changed over the last few years the culture of holding ourselves accountable from focusing very much on our science quality and our publications to making delivering development outcomes the core of our business. We still will look at science quality. We still want to know that we publish and that we have good research through high impact journals. But I think we have heard enough of our investors say, look, what we want to do with the CGIR is by development outcomes. Yes. And that sort of gradually goes through all our programs. So we get good, you know, this is our jargon. We have to have a good theory of change. We have to understand the impact pathway. We have to understand who our boundary partners are, who the partners are that will deliver these outcomes with us. And we have to be measurable in our outcomes. And what that really means is we have to take it to the farmer, as we heard this morning. Great. Well, I think. Frank deserves a big round of applause for having endured today and put on a wonderful program. And I, <laughs> and I think he's going to wrap it up here. So Yes, I, I do need one minute. And you know, the whole day people have been giving me notes about what I was supposed to say. And at this moment, other than thanking Stephanie that I know I should do, thank you. The one thing they didn't give me was the list of everybody to thank because you know and I don't want to stand between you and cocktails for a half hour by listing everybody that we should thank but I really would like to thank you and the audience first and foremost this was the very first CGIR development dialogue and I would like to declare it a success thanks to you showing up I think we should do this again I don't know exactly when and how, because we, of course, did this because the UN Secretary General had his climate summit, because all these things came together very nicely. Can't quite promise you that we'll be here again a year from now in New York, but we should figure out how to make the development dialogues, I think, a continuing conversation, because I think today, definitely, we benefited. I hope you found it as interesting as we did. Certainly, a number of people during the day kept telling me that we had such interesting speakers, that there were some very interesting conversations. So I think, uh, thank you first and foremost in the audience, but I would like to call out one or two people as well. And I think John Colmey sitting right there, uh, I would credit him with being the first person that sort of talked to me at least 
what, in February 2013, I think, a year and a half ago, said, the CJR needs a signature event. We need to step up. We need to show that we really are relevant to the whole development agenda. We heard you, John, and you pushed that idea, and we followed that up. I think a lot of his communicator colleagues at the same time, they have worked very hard to make this a success. Thank you, John, and your colleagues. I would also say, in my role, I make lots of proposals all the time, and I get a lot of sometimes, let's say, skeptical responses to all those proposals that we make. I don't think I've made any one proposal to the centers and CRP directors that was so quickly and positively received, including people pitching in and saying, okay, you need money, we need to do this. So all the centers and CRP directors who pitched in to make this happen, thank you for your immediate and rapid support. Thank you. <laughs> and of course, CRP leaders who are organizing the sessions and lots of people who are doing the logistics, and let me call out one person and represent all of those. Anna Edwards, who didn't sleep a lot of the last couple of months as project manager, and through her, a lot of other people who behind the scenes made all this happen. I can't call out all of you, but we appreciated it, and I think maybe through that we can give all, you know, give your neighbor a pat on the back and say thank you. Thank you very much. And we all deserve a drink. Thank you very much. Drinks closed. Some final housekeeping that the cocktail reception is uh, being held uh, upstairs on the fourth floor. So uh, you are very welcome to join the cocktail reception on the fourth floor. It's just going up where we had the lunch. The fourth floor, just going up one stairs from here. If you would like to join us for the cocktail, please do go upstairs and um, have some fun over there. Thank you very much.